Welcome to the South Sudan RSH webinar on strengthening sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment reporting mechanisms in South Sudan. So our main aim of this of uh, the webinar today is to raise awareness on how all stakeholders can collectively improve reporting mechanisms to encourage reporting of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. And we are only going to focus at the reporting mechanisms available in South Sudan. As I said earlier on, we have two panelists with us. Uh, the first one is going to be Gaspar Amule. Mr. Gaspar Amule is a South Sudanese licensed advocate and legal consultant. He's a senior researcher with extensive experience in legal research, surveys, training, policy and legal analysis and development of organizational operating policies and procedures. He has extensive experience in conducting research on safeguarding, designing safeguarding policies, and training NGO staff and community members on safeguarding in South Sudan. Mr. Gaspar will take us through the conventional mechanisms for reporting, how they are set up, and also their characteristics. Our second panelist is uh, Ms. Kiden Lukudu, who is a lecturer at the University of Juba, a consultant and an activist. She consulted with several government institutions, INGOs and NGOs on safeguarding, climate change, gender analysis and mainstreaming. She also consulted with RSH South Sudan and mentored CSOs on safeguarding. She's currently the acting director of Amal Chariot Foundation, an organization advocating for and empowering, and empowering women and children. Ms. Kiden will discuss the practical challenges faced in using these reporting mechanisms, as well as context-based recommendations to improve how we report. We also have a translator, someone who will translate into Arabic. Uh, that's none other than Francis Michael Awang, who is a journalist and a writer. Uh, he previously worked in many local media agencies as a writer and a correspondent. He's also a researcher at Diversity Center for Strategic Studies and was a former editor at Al Mokif Arabic newspaper in Juba. You're all welcome. And I will be your chair, Carolyn Kibos, who is the National Associate of the RSH South Sudan. So we'll go straight up. Our topic today is going to be basically on reporting mechanisms. And when we say reporting mechanisms, we are meaning systems that enable survivors and victims of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, and even witnesses and advocates to report crimes or violation. So we also have to know that combating sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment depends on how reporting and feedback mechanisms are available, both at the organization level and also at community level, because we know that these things happen both in organizations and also in communities. Therefore, organizations are required to establish effective and safe mechanisms for reporting and receiving feedback, both at their own level as the organization and also to the community, because sometimes these uh, mechanisms vary. And also it's a must for us not to undermine that the most effective reporting mechanisms are those ones that are developed together with the staff, that's if the one for the organization, and also with the community members. Because these people are able to spot out the barriers to reporting that uh, others may be experiencing based on the different reasons like gender, disability, race, age, or other conditions. So we'll, we'll go straight to the first presentation on the conventional reporting mechanisms, and that's going to be none other than Kaspar Amule. You're welcome, Kaspar. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, reporting mechanisms is the only way we can translate uh, safeguarding policies into reality to address the needs of survivors and deliver justice to survivors. And this reporting mechanism, in order for them to be safe and effective, there are a number of characteristics that we consider as yardstick to measure the quality of these reporting standards. And uh, one of these uh, benchmarks is confidentiality. 
Uh, we need to ensure that the reporting mechanisms provide uh, a safe and confidential environment for survivors, witnesses, or even advocates who would like to report cases on, on, on safeguarding sexual harassment, uh, exploitation, abuse. And uh, the reporting mechanism should be able to limit information sharing within persons responsible for managing the case. We understand that this is extremely important because there is always an issue of rephrasal to people who have reported cases of sexual harassment, abuse, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, exploitation. So it's important that we ensure that people who report these cases are protected by ensuring that their information, their identity is not known uh, widely, except for purposes of managing the case. Uh, the second uh, characteristic is accessibility. We need to make sure that these reporting mechanisms are accessible uh, to all groups of persons, both within the organization staff, but also at the community level. Uh, and that has a lot of components. It brings in whether oh, children can easily access those mechanisms, whether elderly persons can easily access, and whether persons with disability can easily access. So there are a number of needs that we need to look at with regard to how to make it uh, accessible for children, for elderly persons, and for persons with disability, in order to make sure that we just do not have safeguarding reporting mechanisms that people have difficulties accessing them. Next. And the third yardstick is transparency. Transparency is important in the sense that both the organization staff and community members need to know that they are reporting mechanisms in place. Otherwise, they cannot use that reporting mechanism. So to make it transparent, one is that even the very process of developing those mechanisms need to involve the staff of the organization as well as the community members. So that is to give a sense of ownership and for them to understand how to use uh, those reporting mechanisms. And second is there should be a usual way of informing the staff of the organization and community members about the availability of the reporting mechanisms. This need to be done, uh, for example, for the staff in, uh, through routine uh, inductions uh, training uh, for staff of the organization, especially for new recruits, for them to know that the organization has in place reporting mechanisms and the same for the for community members. So it's recommended that organizations during their regular activities always integrate awareness component on safeguard on the available reporting mechanisms so that each community member they reach would be able to know that they are available uh, reporting mechanisms in place as well as how to use them and access them. So number four is about the safety. Uh, which is again a very important element uh, that it's important for us to know that reporting uh, sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment cases often attract a number of risks. And those risks are often are presented against the people who report like survivors, witness, whistleblowers, or even advocates. So it, in order for us to ensure that they are safe, we need to make sure that we develop mechanisms to protect them and uh, protecting them, one is through ensuring that uh, we do a, a proper assessment of what do they think could be potential risk in the reporting process. And secondly, it's a component of ensuring uh, it's confidential. Uh, reporting mechanisms are confidential and we do not share uh, information of people who report so that they do not attract reprisal against themselves and they do not face any risk uh, against themselves. So uh, when developing uh, the reporting mechanisms, there are key considerations that we need to understand uh, on how to go about this. And there are a number of important questions that we need to ask if we are developing a reporting mechanisms. We would ask uh, how will beneficiaries, and that of course includes this organization staff and community members, including community members in remote areas, be able to make complaints and can a complaint be made anonymously? This is important with the component of the confidentiality and safety that some reporters would do this wish to report a case, but they don't want their identity to be known. So we need to be able to develop mechanisms that actually protect them from this. And if they don't want to share their information related to their identity, the reporting mechanism should be able to provide that option. 
and can a complaint be made verbally or in a written form? This is also important, especially in a context in, like South Sudan, where we have a high illiteracy rate. It's always important for us to consider that not every reporting can be done in a written form because there are people who cannot write it. We have uh, language barriers in place. We have education issues and illiteracy issues. So it's important that the safeguarding mechanisms need to consider both orally and verbal reporting uh, process. And uh, we also need to look at, is it possible to file a complaint on behalf of somebody else? Because not always is somebody who is a survivor that would like to report a case of sexual harassment, abuse, uh, and exploitation. Sometimes there are incidents where somebody who is just concerned as an advocate or a protector of rights have seen something bad and would like to report that and that need to be provided. So this is an exception to the principle of the law that you need to have what they call locus standi. You need to be affected directly in order for you to report case. For safeguarding uh, uh, incidences or CI incidences, we allow that every concerned person should be given that opportunity to report a case. And those mechanisms, the reporting mechanisms, should allow that uh, to happen. Is it possible to file a complaint on behalf of somebody? Yes, this is very important. And because we also have issues related to persons who are unable to, to travel, people who are unable to, to report due to disability issues, and they need to be assisted. And we also have students so that need to be assisted by guidance. So it's important that the reporting allows for all those groups of people who are interested to report. And are there existing community-based reporting mechanisms that can be used? Sometimes you do not just need to come with new reporting mechanisms as an organization. You might need to integrate your reporting mechanisms to the already existing available reporting mechanisms, because this could be the reporting mechanisms that community members actually trust. And therefore, as an organization, it's important for you to know uh, whether or not there are existing reporting mechanisms at the level of the community before you think about coming up with your reporting mechanisms. And can a few different reporting options be provided? And the question of the option is very important. And we know that there are a number of reporting mechanisms. We can have a focal fashion, we can have a website-based reporting mechanism, we can have uh, a toll-free calls uh, using a mobile number. And you need to weigh about all these options and in consultation with the communities to know which one actually works for the community. And it's always recommended that we have a multiple options approach to reporting for people to easily access them and report on uh, sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment incidences. And what are others doing in the area and can you combine reporting channel with them? So the working together in a coordination is very important. We know that organizations don't work alone. Where you are working as an organization, there could be already organizations that are doing that. And it's important for you to do some sort of integrated reporting mechanisms together as an organization to respond to and address uh, sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment cases. So let us look at what are these reporting me mechanisms. Some organizations do a sort of a community outreach if they don't have resources to put in place a focal person at the community level. And this involves a visit uh, to community members on a regular basis to enable uh, a space where community members can openly come up with the complaints related to sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment uh, committed by the staff of the organization. And another option is also having uh, safeguarding focal persons. And, uh, this is important and you don't have to have staff put as focal persons. If you don't have resources, you can as well train community members. You need to think about a very good selection criteria of persons that are trusted in the community and have a good record in safeguarding. So these people can be trained at the community level and they can coordinate with the organization as focal persons for reporting. At the level of the organization, you may also need to put a staff that are designated as focal persons for any, any staff who has a complaint about uh, safeguarding to report to uh, within the organizations. So another option is a web-based complaints addresses, which is also another good idea. Uh, however, it requires that uh, persons who use them as a staff and, uh, and community members should be able to have internet and access uh, the web-based reporting mechanism. So often a mixture of, of these different options helps a lot because it will be able to respond to the needs of organization staff as well as uh, the needs of community members. 
So we also could use secure complaints or suggestion boxes. So complaints or suggestion boxes are easy way also of doing that where you don't have focal persons, for example, an organization has a field office and the field office only have one staff. And of course that person cannot be the focal person to receive the same complaints. So you could consider putting a suggestion box where people can drop in uh, complaints related to sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. And when you do that, make sure that the lock or the key for the suggestion box is kept by somebody who's responsible for managing uh, sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment cases. And that person regularly opens that suggestion box to find out what is there, because we know that when cases are reported, it's important that the organization is speedily respond to those cases and address them. And we would have community members who have been trained on, uh, on sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment for safeguarding to help link the organizations uh, to community members on reporting processes. So those could be a possible a range of, of options that you can have in place uh, for reporting. Which ones works very well, depending on assessment with organization staff and community members. So uh, we also have participatory assessments. With the participatory assessments, sometimes you would go together as different organizations or as one organization and have an engagement with the community members to discuss generally about performance of the organization, how the staff of the organizations are behaving in the community. And that need to be done, for example, by somebody who is at a position of a senior level talking about how the uh, staff at the field level are performing. And in order to allow community members, for example, to speak freely, you need to make sure that they maybe, for example, the field office staffs are not available in that community engagement meeting because if they really actually have cases against them, they'll find it very difficult to report if they are available. So considering the confidentiality protection, it's important that you provide that space to do that. So open days are also another way of doing it at a community level, where you have an engagement at the community level to discuss uh, uh, safeguarding issues with community uh, members. And we could also have designated email address and telephone numbers. Within the organization, for example, that works very well for, for a staff of the organization to report uh, sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment cases if they are email address. And those email addresses need to be protected in terms of who can access them, because the question about confidentiality and protection also comes in. So those are a range of options that you would think about uh, developing them. For example, South Sudan Law Society uses suggestion box in Malakal because we have only two field officers and uh, they, they can't open those suggestion box. So somebody from the uh, head office from Juba goes there regularly on a monthly basis to check on what is on the suggestion box. If there are complaints, and they'll be able to follow up with those complaints. We have also a telephone numbers put on the suggestion box for persons who do not want to write or who cannot write, but just would like to report cases orally. So they would uh, call directly those telephone numbers and there is a designated person at the national level to listen to those complaints and follow up with them. And for save the children, they use this a range of things. They have a web-based reporting mechanisms for, for staff. We have two options. One, if you can provide your details or you can uh, report as an anonymous person. They also have uh, focal persons at the, all their field locations uh, to receive cases about sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. And then they have a management team at the national level that often goes to investigate and come up with decisions on how to address uh, those cases. And they also have uh, telephone numbers for, uh, for oral or verbal reporting of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment incidences. So setting up uh, reporting mechanisms is really an important process, and it determines how effective these uh, reporting mechanisms can be. And uh, how do we set up these mechanisms? There are a number of steps that we need to take. Step number one is to do consultation. So we need to do consultation with uh, staff of the organization and with community members, because these reporting mechanisms are going to be used by the staff or community members. And when you do consultation, you need to be aware that even at the organization level, there is a category of staff that they do not feel comfortable in speaking about what are the best options to report to. And that is common in South Sudan with uh, international organizations. They are international staff 
and then their national staff. And often you find that the national staff have issues against the international staff and they don't find it comfortable to speak in front of them. For for a number of reasons, they fear that they might lose their job. And if you do consultation, it's in, in, important for you to know the power imbalance among the staff and do focus group discussions in a manner that allow the staff to speak freely on what can actually work for them to report uh, sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. In a similar way with the community members, it's important to consider, for example, in the African culture that women, for example, don't feel comfortable speaking about every details in front of men. So you might need to consider have a focus group discussions with children, with women, with persons with disability, with men, in order for you to hear their honest understanding of what works for them in order for them to report uh, fear incidences. And that is important. And the groupings in the community is important, especially with persons with disability, that we need to know how best can persons with disability be able to to record these cases. There is a, a guidance, a detailed or more guidance on how to come up and develop um, effective safeguarding uh, reporting mechanisms on the support and resource, uh, resource hub. And the link here provided can lead you to a number of resources that provide you more guidance and more details on how you can do consultations and how you can set up uh, reporting mechanisms. So the second thing after you have done uh, inclusive and uh, comprehensive consultation with organization staff and community members, you now go to the second stage of designing those mechanisms. And I always recommend that this need to be done in a co-creation process. So in a workshop where you sit together, for example, with community members and carefully think about it, guide them on what they think would work for them to report, identify the barriers, to reporting and how can you best address those barriers? What are the best options for the different categories of the community members to report on it? And you also need to do uh, co-creation with the organization staff to see what are the best options for the organization staff uh, to report on that. So it needs to be a joint process, not just one consultant sitting in one house or in his or her own office and design a, a, a reporting mechanism, then you just go for awareness. No, that, then, that's not how it works. Because this co-creation uh, works or provides also a process of a validation on the information that you have gathered through the consultation for them to know, yes, this is what we recommended works for us to report on. So once you have designed this, you need to do awareness. And this is a routine process. It's not a one-on-off event. You need to do awareness for the organization staff continuously whenever you have new staff, always uh, integrate awareness on the available reporting mechanisms uh, to your induction training on the organization policies so that every staff get to know the details and how to report on sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment cases. The same way with community members, I recommend that organizations always integrate just a session on awareness on the available reporting mechanisms on sexual exploitation, abuse and, and harassment in each of the outreach activities that they have with community members. You could have at the end of the, of the training or the workshop, somebody to speak for 30 minutes about the available mechanisms and how people can access them. So this needs to be routine because people move, community members don't stay in one place. They move, today new people come in, others go out, you just need to do it as a routine process. The same for the organization staff. So that way you'll really have a create a, you'll create a good understanding of the available mechanisms to everyone that you reach and they will be able to access them. That's why you may need to go faster than this. Yeah, uh, yes. And uh, lastly, you need to, to do the rolling out and the operationalizing them. If you have a focal person to be put in place, you need to put them in place, resource them, and let them start handling cases. So the handling of cases, including receiving these cases, deciding on whether to do investigation, investigating them, and giving a feedback. So that is the whole process that you now need to do. And that, for example, includes that the setup is, uh, is child friendly and it's also friendly for persons with disability. 
So for example, you might need to consider the need uh, and the use of interpreters for persons with disability to be able to report on that. You also need to consider people with uh, uh, child psychology in order for them to speak very well to children. So the support and uh, resource hub also have a lot of materials on child-friendly reporting mechanisms and how to talk to students about safeguarding. These are also important resources that you can use in, in a setting up reporting mechanisms and operationalizing them. Finally, uh, on the reporting mechanisms is that you always need to do a review and evaluate the mechanisms. Just because you have gone through this nice process doesn't mean they're going to work very well for you. So you always need to do a review. And if you do this, you, you talk to staff again about whether or not the reporting mechanisms are OK, what are the challenges, what are the barriers. You do the same with community members. Uh, for you to be able to identify new uh, challenges or barriers to reporting and improve on the reporting mechanisms. So it is a routine and a vicious cycle, just as any part of the society, that we always have to continue improving on it and to address new uh, or emerging reporting barriers. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Gaspar. So we'll go straight to the challenges and recommendations by Kidin. And uh, she will uh, go through the challenges quickly because we all know the challenges that we face and concentrate mostly on the recommendations, on the context-based recommendations that may work out for us. You're welcome, Kidin. Thank you, Caroline. So based on the presentation that we have, we know that the reporting mechanisms uh, you know, should be anchored within an organization or a community and that it should be gender and culturally sensitive so that we can maximize the safety and effectiveness. So the following are the challenges faced in reporting sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. Number one uh, is culture, tradition, and beliefs. So we find that reporting is limited in South Sudan due to some cultural norms that hinders the exclusion of information. Uh, for example, sexual activity in many cultures in South Sudan uh, outside of marriage is considered adultery, even if it's a forced kind of sexual experience. So in many cases, it's met with violence, stigma, the person is discriminated against or excluded from their family, from their community, even the organization that they're working in. In other instances, when these cases happens to men and boys, they fear to report because they don't want to be seen as weak or homosexual because let's face it, in South Sudan, homosexuality is a taboo within many cultures. And also there's that belief that if you complain or you challenge those who are in authority or those who have power, uh, it's unacceptable in our culture. And this limits uh, reporting of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. Number two is the lack of confidence or trust in the system. You know, you find that survivors do not believe that if they report, there will be any positive results out of this. And there are many examples or uh, documented evidence all across the world that attest to this. And especially in a wider international aid sector, we have the case of UNMIS, you know, uh, where there's allegations of sexual exploitation against uh, police officers in WOW that has blown up and it was all over the place. And there are even cases that date back up to maybe um, 2015 in Malacca. And funny enough, you know, even after this report has come out, you find that allegation of this abuse and exploitation continued for at least 18 months. So this actually leave survivors not to believe in the system. Another example in one of the organizations is that, you know, a person reported an abuse of power to the uh, uh, human resource manager. And to that person's dismay, they found that the perpetrator was seated in the email itself. So this shows that there is failure uh, of the organizational leadership to uphold equal rights of those who come forward and also their protection. And you find that sometimes 
in, in these organizational settings, gender norms and power imbalances are not challenged enough and it can put people at risk or those who come forward at risk. And this puts in that belief that you know, impunity of abusers is really the country and that authorities sometimes can be bribed or they stand aside with the abusers. So survivors feel like the system is not worth it for them to trust it. And, they, and, and, and that limits uh, reporting of cases of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. Uh, number three is language barrier. In a setting like South Sudan, where there's many national and international organizations, you find that there are many also national and ethnic languages being used in these settings. So sometimes this hinders communication between aid workers and the community, or even those who are working within uh, the, the, the organizational setting. So this undermines reporting of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment, both for the international and the national staff. Number four is lack of awareness. Um, we know that you know, uh, lack of awareness about sexual exploitation and abuse is real in South Sudan. Many people don't see it as something that is wrong. And sometimes it's perceived as a normal or unacceptable behavior in organizational setting. In other cases, when there's actually awareness, people might still not come forward, whether it's within the organization or the community. And this is for several reasons. Sometimes people don't want to be labeled as troublemaker. You're coming to make trouble. You're coming to you know, talk about this and that. And sometimes the, the, the survivors or the victims feels like if they come forward, they will harm their peers. So lack of awareness about um, uh, these incidences or cases is a major challenge that limits the reporting of such cases. Another challenge is in accessibility of reporting mechanisms. You know, sometimes these reporting mechanisms are not designed in a way that is accessible for every person and survivors from different form of disabilities. For example, people who have hearing impairments, when they don't have access to interpretation services, it becomes difficult for them to report. Those who are physically impaired, you know, when they don't have adequate transportation or the proper infrastructure to reach these mechanisms, they won't be able to report any cases that or incidences that happens to them. And also those with mental health and, you know, psychological or intellectual disabilities, more often they're excluded out when it comes to reporting mechanisms in our context. So this also a big challenge in reporting such incidences. Lastly, is children. You know, um, in South Sudan, children are not being taken seriously. You know, uh, when, when they talk about or when they speak up about sexual exploitation, abuse or harassment, they are not believed. And sometimes they even stigmatize, especially when they speak against someone who's perceived in the community as, uh, you know, a trustworthy person or someone who has power within that certain community or certain organization. And in other instances, it's the parents themselves, even if they know that their children are facing such uh, exploitation and abuse, they might not want to come forward and report it because they want to protect the reputation of their children. And in certain cultural norms, you know, uh, for example, where girls can be deemed unmarriageable, if they come forward and report sexual exploitation. So many families, uh, you know, many parents actually hide this truth. They don't want to come forward and report about it. And even some children actually fear to talk about this because they will not be believed or they will be stigmatized. And this creates a major challenge for us to, to be able to report cases of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. So, what can we do to improve reporting of such incidences? You know, first and foremost, we need to understand that prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, sexual exploitation, harassment, and abuse is a collective action. You know, it's something that is important to all organizations to understand that we need to acknowledge that this issue requires social change and that it might take some time for it to be actualized and realized. So, uh, all the stakeholders must realize that collective action is the way forward. So all the organization, all the partners that are working in the organizational settings, 
in South Sudan must commit to, the, to do the following. Number one, next please. Number one, organizations must create an enabling reporting culture. That means there should be organizational accountability within organize, this organization. You know, they should support and protect those who come forward to report any violation, crime, or uh, cases of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. And when they come forward, as we well, Jasper has talked about earlier, their confidentiality must be upheld. And this is for their protection. And then we should also have a clear uh, response and feedback mechanisms. So this actually will enable us to handle cases of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment in a proper manner. And that it, it actually gives back that confidence to those who wants to complain about such violations. Secondly, organization also must keep reporting processes simple. You should not complicate it. You should have a clear guidance on how complaints should be made and who this complaint should be made to. So if this is done in a proper manner, it enables everyone it to, to, to come forward and report any uh, cases that might affect them. Number three is the, the, the need to create multiple layers of mechanism of reporting. You know, uh, if you have numerous reporting options, you ensure that all the vulnerable people have accessibilities to this. That means you need to take into account issues of literacy, issues of disability, issues of language, especially in setting where there are refugees or you know, minority ethnic groups. And in that instance, you will make sure that the system is tailored to cater for everyone's need. Next, please. Uh, last but not least is creation of interagency cooperation, especially in community-based complaint mechanisms. So research has endorsed uh, this idea of creation of a single interagency reporting system uh, that operates within a community or a humanitarian setting. So in that community, in that mechanism, sorry, uh, all the complaints will be received from multiple organizations, and then it will be referred back to a single or proper unit within that same organization for a follow-up. So if this is done in a proper manner, we can ensure that you know, uh, such incidences of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment that has been reported numerously in the context of South Sudan uh, will be reduced, and uh, actually there will be uh, an, an improvement in handling these cases. And lastly, involving a trusted independent figure from within the community or organization who should ideally be a female. And this is also is backed up by numerous research across the world. And, uh, you know, because there's this evidence that women in operational or management positions can contribute to a more inclusive and less discriminatory and a very effective workplace culture. So uh, in, in, in the case of South Sudan, women organizations or coalition or even other civil society organizations are therefore placed in a better way to, to, to act as a mediator in these settings, especially when they are not the beneficiaries or they're not involved in delivering aid directly. So these are some of uh, the ways that we can be able to improve reporting of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment cases uh, within our context here in South Sudan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kiden. Um, so I'm going to read out the questions, but in the meantime, um, on the screen, you will see my email address for any further questions that you want to ask because I know the time is limited, but I'm going to read out the questions and the panelists will take it upon themselves to answer as part from the ones that were directly uh, mentioned to them. For instance, uh, one has uh, asked Amule, kindly elaborate more on your later stage, how issues related to government staff working in education system and whose action of sexual exploitation jeopardizes organizational reporting mechanisms because their victims happen to be beneficiaries of the organization. 
Another question is uh, how well are the phone numbers and web-based methods used? And also someone else is asking um, that in, pre in protection of sexual exploitation and abuse, we have the obligation to report anyway, but without mentioning the survivor or complainant details and we'll address it differently to find out if SIA is happening. But then what happens if you don't have the consent of that survivor or the complainant? So let's answer these first three questions, then we, we take up more. Thank you, Caroline, for reading out those questions. Uh, uh, one is really related to government uh, officials working in a context of education sector, for example. And uh, one challenge is that uh, with reporting mechanisms and how what we are able to do relates to our mandate. And our mandate is with our staff that are working with us and to some large extent, our partners. So with uh, uh, government officials, Often it's recommended that government institutions like school also have safeguarding mechanisms in place. That means they need to have policies, they have to, they need to have reporting mechanisms put in place for uh, complainants and survivors to be able to report on that. Uh, the second options where there are no uh, policies and reporting mechanisms for government institutions, as the case is in South Sudan, is that most of the safeguarding uh, incidences or cases are actually uh, criminal offenses under the, the penal code in South Sudan. So one would take an option of uh, using the justice system to report those offenses in absence of government institutions uh, not having policies for safeguarding and not having mechanisms for addressing safeguarding issues within the institution. Uh, Web-based reporting mechanisms is, uh, to me, I think maybe the experience of South Sudan, considering the limited accessibility to internet, it works very well only for organization staff. And of course, we say that these mechanisms are meant to protect staff of the organization, as well as communities where these organizations work. So web-based reporting mechanisms can work very well with organization staff because they have access to internet and they can easily be acquainted on how to use them. Uh, phone numbers can work very well for community members, especially if you're in a place where there is a high literacy cases, ideas about suggestion box, focal persons have also challenges of transportation. You're working in a place like Bor, sometimes you'd have flats issues in a place. It's very difficult for people to move, even if you have a focal person in your field office, it still becomes a challenge for people to move. But if they have a phone numbers, it's very easy for you to receive a case concerning that as well. And lastly, on uh, reporting on behalf of others. And indeed, it's important always that you get a consent of that person that you are reporting on. Uh, and if it's completely a child that cannot give a consent, according to the legal definition in South Sudan, uh, maybe somebody who is under the age of 11, because from the age of 12, the child is able to give a consent. A child under the age of uh, 11, at least you need the consent from the guidance. But a child from the age of 12 is able to give consent if it is not able to commit a crime. So often you need to get a consent of the person before you report on behalf of that person. And that starts by you explaining to them that what has happened to them or how or him is actually an offense. It's, it's something that is serious and there are mechanisms in place to address that. You can also explain what possible uh, what possibilities can happen if the case is reported. And it's also important to explain possible risks if you're aware that may happen because uh, it's important that uh, we know that actually there are risks related to this and that there, it's important for us to also make it aware to survivors that this risk could happen. The question about the refraisal, especially in the context of South Sudan, it's really a challenge. So once you make that awareness to the person and uh, he or she gives a consent for you to report on their behalf, then you'll be able to report. So the consent is really important. Thank you. Maybe Kiden would like to add on that. Um, on the consent, yes. Actually, one of the participants also mentioned here that it's very important to get the consent of someone, which I agree with. You cannot uh, and you will not do any report 
on anyone's um, behalf without their consent because you don't know what their their wish is. So it's always very important that you have to get the consent. Uh, we have um, someone saying that uh, when faced with an ethical dilemma where you need to report or ob observe the, I mean where you need to protect or observe the rights of the survivor and taking action, investigating SEER allegations, what should someone do? So the first thing or the basic thing, I'm going to answer this one to, uh, straight away, the basic or the first, the most important thing is that you always have to protect the survivor. You always have to respect their rights, protect their rights, respect their wishes and needs. So if you're coming into a situation whereby these two are in conflict, you always have to go with the first one of protecting the survivor rights. A question from Maggie from Zimbabwe. She's saying in Zimbabwe we are having, we are finding that going to a suggestion box is not a private matter. Farmers are afraid of being seen going to drop off something in the suggestion box. Also having many cases of lost keys to the suggestion box. Yes, this is right, uh, Maggie. I think um, the suggestion box doesn't work to everyone for everyone. So we need to see what works best for us. Some people are not comfortable with the suggestion box. That's why we said we need to have a variety of reporting mechanisms in place and everyone chooses what they think is they are comfortable with. Adriana is asking what are the steps that are now taken in South Sudan to have this one single interagency reporting channel? How are big organizations responding to this initiative? Uh, someone else is asking, do you have a designed material for people with disabilities? Another one is asking, what happens when they don't give the consent for us to report? This one is already answered. So we have those two questions. On the design materials for people with disabilities, yes, there are other organizations that deal directly with people with disabilities that you can reach out to. Uh, steps. I don't know, Gaspar Okiden, would you want to answer on the steps that are taken to have one single interagency reporting channel? Yeah, yes. I will take on that. Oh. Yes, Kiden, you can speak to that? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I, I, I have an idea about uh, this kind of interagency, what, which is called ISAC, uh, Interagency Standing Committee. Uh, it's a global dashboard that actually tracks issues of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment in humanitarian settings. And they have been actually um, active in South Sudan since the whistleblowing of the case of UNMIS that took place some few years back. So uh, as far as I know, this is uh, a step forward in creating uh, that system that enables all the, the, the complaints to be rounded and taken back to individual organizations so that it's dealt with. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jasper, you can also add in on that. Very good, thank you. You have started in the right direction. Uh, yes, uh, after the cases of UNMIS in WOW that come up in Juba, uh, UN agencies uh, began to think about what they need to put in place to protect people against sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. And yes, they develop a strategy for UN agencies, and that's what they call interagencies in the definition of the UN. So their idea is that they also hope to roll this down to national organizations that each of these UN agencies are supporting. So the idea is each time they have a funding for an organization, they would recommend that the organization integrate those policies and reporting mechanisms uh, for them to respond to the case. But in terms of practicalities on the ground, the reporting mechanism for interagency is only currently limited to UN agencies. Uh, national organizations still do not, are not part of that uh, integrated system for reporting. I think that is one important thing that also uh, organizations in South Sudan need to discuss together through the coordination forums like protection cluster, GBB subcluster, child protection cluster, for them to think of how can they develop more integrated uh, reporting mechanisms. Someone is asking on how we can handle myths and social misconceptions such, uh, for instance, the ones that believe um, that it's always innocent men that are commonly accused of sexual violence and that women often lie about it to get revenge. 
Uh, that's one. And then someone is asking again on the case of consensus between the perpetrator and the victim's family, uh, where they agree for marriage or compensation, what should be the best approach for an organization in reporting? I, I think for the first question, uh, issues of awareness are really important. Um, in, in South Sudan, you know, sexual exploitation, abuses, harassment is still a new concept uh, to many national organizations, to, to, to even to the communities, because it's perceived as something that is normal or, you know, acceptable when someone just throws some insensitive remarks towards you. Some people actually take it as flattery or they, they feel happy about it. So uh, awareness, raising awareness is something very important so that we'll be able to uh, counter the effects of these traditions and the effects of these norms. And as Jasper has put it perfectly, that awareness raising should be a consistent kind of a thing. It should not be a one-time uh, you know, uh, occasion. Uh, you know, We've talked about it and that's it. We should always keep on reminding the community. We should always keep on reminding those who are working in different organizations about, uh, you know, uh, the, the effect of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment, and the importance of uh, reporting such cases. So, to deal with the, the 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 norms and the culture, the number one thing that we need to do is to raise awareness and speak about it and shed light on sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. Uh, Jasper, you can add on on this and also take on the second uh, question, if you. Very good, thank you. Yes, one thing I would like to 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 say is that not every uh, uh, sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment allegation that is reported is taken as fact, and a decision is made on that. In fact, uh, investigation mechanisms uh, are very impartial and ensure that. Uh, it protects both the alleged perpetrator and the survivor. So that if there are incidents of somebody falsely being accused, he has not committed that offense or she has not committed that offense, the investigation should, be, should make sure that that person is found, for example, uh, not guilty of the offense and that communication is given back. Uh, so this misconception that men are always innocent and accused is not true. Some of these cases are real, some are not. So experience with handling these cases also so that not every case reported is found to be factual. Others are also lies because there are people who just have a bad intention and want you to be terminated, for example, from work, and they would cook out a story about sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. So we would have materials to share linked later about investigation uh, processes, and it also reflects more importantly on ensuring that there is a protection for both alleged accused persons, perpetrators, but also uh, survivors or reporters. The second question is a very interesting one, and this is always a big dilemma. The question about how do you deal with cases of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment where the family of the survivor have agreed on a separate arrangement? So one thing is what we have already talked about is that a consent of the survivor is important for you as an organization to take on any steps that you need to move forward. So that consent of the survivor does not mean the consent of the family. This is very important in South Sudan because we have seen even marriages that are arranged without the consent of, of, of the girls, for example. And uh, because the family have said that we are fine with whatever happened, and we are arranging, for example, a marriage out of it. Suppose it was a rape between somebody who is at a superior position with somebody who is a cleaner in an office. And so when this comes out, family would approach and say, we are arranging a marriage out of it. We don't have a problem with this person. Yes, let the family could do that. That's beyond our control. But as an organization, we should know that this is really something that is wrong and there should be mechanisms in place, it does not prohibit the organization from sanctioning that person. So I would still recommend that where the survivor, not the family, has truly given a consent for you to proceed with the case as an organization, regardless of what the family arranges, you are free to go as an organization to do the investigation, do the finding, and take the measures against that person, regardless of the family arrangements, because that is important. So just because the family says it's not a crime doesn't mean it's not an offense in the, at the level of the organization. 
Thank you, Gaspar Noel. Could you please pull up the poll? Um, thank you for joining the RSH webinar. We'll share the presentations with you and also we'll be able to share all the questions that have been asked. I know I've not read out all the questions. All of them have not been answered, but we are going to have a typed up document on the questions and providing all the answers that we'll share together with the presentation for all of those who have joined the webinar and those ones who are part of our mailing list. Thank you again. I would also want you to go to our website. You can visit our website on southsudan.safeguardingsupporthub.org. Uh, you will get a lot of resources and materials on the website and you'll also be able to see the section of our newsletter. Uh, we have quarterly newsletters, so if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll be able to receive the newsletter whenever we publish it. You can also follow us on social media at uh, Safeguarding RSH or if you want some special or specific type of support, you can actually write to us on our email as, at askanexpertsouthsudan at rshub.org.uk.